Good morning and welcome everyone to the Rice 360 Institute for Global Health Technologies Spring Global Health Seminar. Um, on behalf of Rice 360, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome Dr. Angelica Florin here today. Uh, Dr. Florin is an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, Division of Neonatology, um, where she has since 1991 established herself as a clinical educator and physician. Born in the Dominican Republic and raised in Colombia, um, she earned a medical degree from the University, uh, Universidad de Nevada um, in Pamplona, Spain in 1972. She completed her internship and residency in pediatrics thereafter <clears throat> in San Juan, <coughs> Puerto Rico, at the University of Puerto Rico. Over her 50-year career, she has presented and published on a range of pediatric care issues um, from meningitis, lead poisoning, hearing loss, pneumonia, and Zika. Um, as a member of, she's been a member of the Academy of Pediatrics uh, since 1992 and president of the Dominican Foundation of, for Mothers and Infants since 1994. The foundation sponsors research that seeks to improve the health of children of the Dominican Republic by addressing preventable infectious disease and is focused on decreasing maternal and newborn mortality in the Dominican Republic, which is the third highest in the Americas after Guyana and, and Haiti. In 2014, she earned the Dominican um, Health Care Association of Florida's Founders Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Florin as she shares with us the current challenges of maternal and infant health care in the Dominican Republic. Thank you, Yvette, for the invitation. Thank you also to Rebecca Richards for this invitation. I am very proud, very happy, very honored uh, to be here to present all of you um, these challenges that we have in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. Um, uh, well, let me just tell you all about what we're doing. Um, uh, we, we work, we're three people working. Um, everything started in the University of Miami, uh, learning uh, all the things that are done, wonderful technologies and every modern thing that is done. Uh, with the direction of Dr. Eduardo Bancalari, that is the, the chief of the division. Um, and here uh, with my friends and colleagues, Dr. Maria Peinado and Dr. Teresa del Moral, um, we get together, we talk, we, and um, they're all interested in public health. Um, we, we, there's a lot of cities. There's a lot of cities that we work with. Um, Santo Domingo, several hospitals, we work in Santiago, we work in Puerto Plata, all the north part, and to the west, we work in Barahona, and many, many places like that. What we do is gather people to one place and teach, and gather people from other places and teach, because we have, no, we have very little vacation time, so that's the way we work. Okay, so Dominican Republic is a middle-income country. Many resources. Uh, of which tourism and agriculture, both are mostly in private hands. There is a lot of agriculture and construction that draws the immigration from Haiti. Uh, there's like 12 million people in Haiti, 12 million people more or less in Dominican Republic with this open border. Uh, two languages are, are needed. Um, basically, well, in Santo Domingo, uh, Spanish, but we have a lot of Creole-speaking people that do not speak Spanish, do not speak English. The longest distance is like four hours. That's a big, big benefit for us. We don't have big rivers to cross. We don't have dangerous animals. Safety is a concern lately. And of course, um, it, uh, COVID has impacted us in a big, big way. Um, you see now, um, this is the delivery rate. Is, this is just published from WHO, op, op, uh, Organization of Pan American OPS. Uh, um, the OPSA is a uh, um, Latin American part of WHO. Uh, and you see how in these last years, this is the maternal mortality and the newborn mortality from 2018 is just going up. And I, I don't think we can blame it all in COVID um, because not many COVID mothers or babies um, but, but the disruption of the whole delivery process, um, uh, all these things that we found that our maternal and infant mortality is really going up. 
Uh, we are very concerned for that. Uh, for many years, they tried to control this, um, and uh, many millions have been spent in education, in equipment, in infrastructure. So, so UNICEF, Save the Children, Project Hope, WHO have been helping, uh, but you know, it should be sustained in the country, which has not been the case. Um, country does not follow protocols or norms. Haiti, Haiti lives in a permanent humanitarian crisis. So it's one crisis after the other. Uh, and, and what happens is that it continues to, to come to, to Santo Domingo to get the medical care, especially mother and baby care. Um, doctors only work half a time. They're poorly paid. They have multiple jobs. Government employs them for life, so you cannot throw them away if they don't work. Nurses are poorly paid, poorly educated, and there's no system of punishment or reward. So if a mother dies, a mother dies. If a baby dies, a baby dies. Then what happened? Oh, he died. He died. So there's not like the United States that you make a big thing about it and you learn from it. That's not the case. So let me, okay, that, that, that's not the case we have. So um, wh why, why is such a mortality? Because there's a constant migration, no strategy, no plan. There's a lot of things, but strategy, there's none. Um, they depend a lot on donations, not on self-support. There is no maintenance of building equipment, medications, and there's no incorporation of the obstetricians to decrease the neonatal death. So, so so we decided to help. First, we were working with the vaccines. We helped um, uh, develop uh, 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 identification of pneumococcal disease. So we worked a lot in pneumococcal disease until finally the Premdar vaccine was started. And they started the Pentacel vaccine that included Haemophilus because we used to have a lot of meningitis, tons of meningitis. We used to have in the main pediatric hospital, every other day, a baby coming in with pleural effusion. You know, that's horrible. So we know, you know, okay, it is pneumococcal and it is hemophilus. So finally, all those vaccines were, were started in 2002. And you see the in, incredible decrease in all those diseases because you, before you went there and you see all these babies with tubes from their chest draining pus and meningitis and all these babies with all these neurological findings with meningitis. And then next day, I come and visit, empty place. Empty place, oh no, we don't have. Come okay, we don't have. No, we don't have because these children are home playing or at school because vaccines work and then continue with the rest. Well, that's what happened. And we that had the foundation decided to change the name of our foundation. And we decided to put it, okay, what's going on now? We, just, we saw, the incredible maternal and newborn mortality. And they say oh, that finally showed up there because it was hidden in between very high pediatric mortality. So we decided, okay, we're gonna dedicate our time, our energies, our foundation, everything to mother and baby care. And we changed the name of our foundation and now it's called Dominican Foundation for Mothers and Infants. And it's, uh, and it's uh, incorporated in the United States uh, from help from us here. Uh, and also we are incorporating in Dominican Republic. So we decided to start several, several programs. The first program that we decided to start is Kangaroo Care. We found the Kangaroo Care uh, in, um, I saw Dr. Del Moral uh, bringing Kangaroo Care in Jackson Memorial in the maternity unit and uh, with the uh, tops and uh, long chase, chase longs and the mother's breastfeeding and skin to skin. And I say, oh my God, this is perfect for Dominican Republic. This is just perfect. Let's just take this to Dominican Republic. So we started Kangaroo Care. Uh, we started teaching the mothers to care of her baby as no matter how small the baby was. The family continued ca taking care. The, the continue at home, mother, father, aunt, everybody take care of the little baby at home. Um, and um, let me see if I have, okay. And then what happened is that we found that um, it decreased the baby mortality. 
uh, and decreased infection, decreased a lot of things. So, okay, let's, let's go rescue the babies from the ICU. Because ICU is a dangerous place to be. Let's rescue them. So they started starting the kangaroo care in the ICU, not already when the babies were discharged, in the ICU. So those little babies, we started kangaroo, get them out of the incubator and mothers kangarooing. And once the baby's out of oxygen and, and IV fluids, start kangaroo. And the next step was creating this um, place where the mother is hospitalized with her baby. Uh, and she's taking care of that baby. The baby's not ready to go, but the baby can be ho mother hospitalized. So we get a room with several beds, with a bathroom, and the hospital brings food for the mothers, and the doctors care, care of the baby, and the mother is the incubator, the mother is the feeder, the mother is the one taking care of the baby. And once the baby is ready to go, one, one mother, once the mother is able to carry the baby home and follow in the and follow uh, ambulatory. And this is the first uh, paper we presented in American Academy of Pediatrics, a 2018 babies from the first day in, I think it's 2012, to 2017, I think. And we started gathering babies. You can see this, this area, how at the beginning, a little bit survived, more or less the same the next year. They learn how to do learning and learning. And now we have more babies and more babies and more babies, mortality down, 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 down. Now we have like 5,000 babies. Challenge, get the numbers, you know. We have a big problem with that. So I don't have it, but I will show it as soon as we get it. We'll show it to you So how good kangaroo care is. Um, and, and then after that, we say, okay, let's get the babies before they get into kangaroo care. So we heard from Project Hope that there was a Nest 360. And she told me, look into Nest 360, maybe see what you can find. And we found Pumani. And we said, oh my God, what is this? This is wonderful. So let's go buy one Pumani. So we bought one Pumani. We took it to our area of research, of pulmonary research in Jackson Memorial in the uh, uh, the people that are experts in that, and they found okay, we need you cannot hook it to the hook it to the electricity. We have different electricity, so I always have to try everything first because if you send it, it goes to it stays there. Nobody use it, so so we have to prove it, try it in our and find it the ways what they could find. So you cannot connect it. Oh, so we have to buy. Um, uh, what do you call this? P power, power. Oh no, that power is no good. We need a power that can go where is oxygen. Otherwise, we're gonna have fire. So we have to get another. Fire. So I, we have to find all these little things that is not little before we send it there. So what we did, we found all this, and with Doctor Jose Tolosa, that is our one of our attendings. Uh, expert in respiratory care, he came with us and we put it in one hospital uh, where Dr. Gonzalez is in San Pedro de Macorís and he taught how to use the Pumani and he taught the nurse, all the nurses were around. Everybody was looking at that money. The first time we can give CPAP with not 100% oxygen. Because our problem is that they get a tank of oxygen and they hook it to the baby and you know, 100% oxygen. First time ever. Uh, with the Pumani, we can give babies CPAP. We know how much CPAP we're giving, and we know how much oxygen we're giving. And we are explaining them the importance of a saturation monitor, which they don't use. They want the babies to be saturated 100%. So all this concept was brought with the Pumani. So we went there, uh, and, the, and then we went back to our hotel, we haven't passed like two, three hours where they call us, listen, we have a baby in the Pumani. The nurses, the nurses put the baby in the Pumani. I can't believe that. Rush back, rush back and take pictures. We were with our mouths open. Look, this is something that the nurses can do. They can use it by the phone. So it was wonderful. So now what happened? 
that we, uh, this is the doctor that works in that hospital. She got expert in using it, um, and the nurses too. And then uh, what continues to be part of respiratory care is uh, we started getting, we need to get more. We need to get more Pumani. It's expensive for us. Um, but I'll tell you what happened. So this is Nelson and this is Joji, nurse practitioner. This is Nelson, PhD in respiratory care. He's fantastic. And he's getting us with a compressor to do zip up for two babies at the same time. Because most of the 170 time hospitals do not have oxygen and air from the wall. So we need to get more Pumanis, but we cannot because it's too expensive for us. But I'll, I'll continue talking about that. So, so we are creating something like this with a blender or not a blender. Um, we don't need a blender. We don't need to, to, we don't need to warm up the water. Um, but we do need a good saturation monitor. And it's very, something very simple. And we, we are instead, uh, anyway, Pumanis is much better. Much, much, much better. We're trying to get more. Um, but but there is not, there's too many hospitals, so we have to get that in all the hospitals. And this is a result of the first Pumanis we got, 58 babies included. Uh, this is the baby some Pumani, the baby no Pumani, uh, average uh, 33 to 40, 34 weeks gestation. Um, average stay, the ones that are or the ones that aren't is more or less the same. Um, and um, one thing good is that at least the, the one babies that are on Pumani, we know the oxygen they received. The other ones we have no idea, probably 100%. So that is a big, big, um, big result for us. Uh, so after that, um, that is a pilot study. We need to continue. The thing is that there are only one Pumani. There's a lot of babies that still need to be on 100% oxygen. So we have to do something about that. Uh, and um, we, Project Hope, bought 22 more Pumanis, but one thing that happens when one big corporation donates, they just get the, get the machine. Goodbye. What do you do with the machine and goodbye? You need to, the machine, it comes with a lot of other things that is education. Education of the physiology of the lung of the premature baby. Education of the of what the nurse does, what the, what the doctor does. Education, when to start, when to stop. Education of, of uh, everything that has to do with uh, uh, the care of a preemie baby. And that's what we lack, and that's why our foundation brings. So we are hunting for all those two other 22 Pumanis uh, and see to get that and to get their numbers and experiences. One good thing is that they are asking us for smaller and smaller cannulas. So that's good. That's, that's telling us they are using it well because they are using it in smaller babies. Good, that's very good. Uh, so we're trying our own bubble zip up for two or for three. Um, and the main thing is shift from the 100% oxygen use. Uh, and, and then we have a high ROP um, result in uh, the following of our kangaroo care. So, so kangaroo care is for, for us the, the um, pillar, pillar of all everything else. With kangaroo care, we found the results. And, uh, and then other th problem they had is they did not have caffeine needed to prevent or treat apnea of prematurity. Before it was used to treat it. Now it's used many, many times to prevent it. Many times you put the baby in Pumani, uh, and, but, but you start early with caffeine to prevent these apneas. So you can get the baby out of there faster. You, you can prevent a lot of intubations.
giving caffeine on the, the time it should be done. But we don't have caffeine. So what a caffeine we have, we had uh, concentrated caffeine, which is very expensive, impossible. For two, three days, and then what else? You cannot send that baby home on the concentrated caffeine. So this is the caffeine there was. Tablet of 200, which you have to choo -choo 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 divide and, and it's dangerous. You don't know how much caffeine you're giving, you know? So uh, our friend from Acromax Laboratories, we, we asked them, can you make caffeine for us in drops so that the mother can give it the same way she gives the, vi the vitamins? She said, yes, so go ahead, do it. And there we have it. So this is, the caffeine has been a big, big help because we don't have to send babies on aminophilin home. These preemie babies start jumping in the mother, so they stop it because they cannot have the baby jumping. And they stop it and the baby has apnea. So now they are going home. Whoever needs it is going home on caffeine. You see, 30 mLs, very easy to give. So baby going home with his caffeine. And then follow up ambulatory until it's not needed, need, not needed anymore. So uh, let me see where I find. Uh, there you go. Uh, so, so this is a study of caffeine. We have 54 babies. Uh, average birth weight, 1.5 kilos. Uh, Abgar, 1 to 5 is 7 to 8. A Silverman Anderson of 4. Uh, average gestational age, 32. And the diagnosis, 90% um, difficulty breathing, suspected sepsis, extreme prematurity, and all kinds of prematurity, extreme, moderate, and late prematurity. And, it, and, and the mothers love it, the doctors love it, everybody's asking for it um, so that they can easily give to the previous in hospital and home. So, um, oh, this is another, uh, okay. These babies remain like 16 days in the hospital uh, with 8.5 days of oral caffeine and the first few days of caffeine IV until they are able to eat. Once they're able to eat, it pass to our oral caffeine and then average days of 16 days and going home. Um, then, okay, then uh, we found, we're looking for jaundice or sepsis. Let me see which one comes first. Okay, sepsis. So we tried to look for sepsis because everybody's septic. When you go and see, everybody's septic. I mean, Everybody's on antibiotics and not plain ampingent, meropenem, all those horrible, com horrible antibiotics that here we only use when we have a bad, bad bug. Why do they start that from the beginning? So, so let's start with GBS. So we did, we got this. They don't do it because they don't know how to do it. We start this Granada medium that uh, our friends from Hospital Aragon in Spain uh, got us got us and we could buy it very, very cheap, two dollars each, each vial, each uh, Petri. So we divide it in two and we have for one mother here, for one mother here. You see, this is how, the, you, you can do it at bedside. Just get the vaginal rect and get the, and then lab, put the name into, into laboratory. And you put a, a little square of, um, uh, you don't, I don't know how to, you call these little squares. On top of the, on top of this, and then it creates CO2. You do this, and you put it, it creates CO2. And with the CO2, the GBS grows and gives you these beautiful uh, orange um, colonies. GBS. You don't have to do anything else. You don't need an incubator. You can leave it overnight. And if you don't believe, you can leave it another overnight, uh, and then it will grow. And and if if it doesn't grow, the colonization is very 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 low. So you don't, you, that, that's what you want to know. So, so this is what we used. And we got some, some uh, or 20%, depends, very varial cultures. But what happens with this? When you go and see where they prepare the IV fluids and everything for the baby, this is our pharmacy. I don't know if other countries you find pharmacies like this. this is, there's no pharmacy. There's no pharmaceutical, nobody. She goes with this, with this and prepares 
with these syringes, all the medications for everybody. She has no gloves. She has no, uh, you call this um, f laminar flow thing. There's nothing. And she has cream for her hands, milk, pampers, and everything is open. And she has all these medications to put to one baby. And this put in the in this bottle, she puts all these five percent this uh, dextrose, ten percent dextrose, sodium chloride, sodium magnesium, potassium chloride, glucose, and she forgot to put there E. coli, Klebsiella, Salmonella, all the bacteria that go into there. No wonder everybody gets infected. Everybody gets infected, and we have a big, big problem with that. Uh, because uh, when we do the cultures, this is uh, Robert Cabral culture, where we find out where we worked uh, for the pneumococcal in Haemophilus. This is uh, blood cultures in December one time, 2020. Acinetobacter baumani, Enterococcus fecalis, E. coli, Enterococcus, Klebsiella, Pseudomona, whatever. GBS still there, but it's overcome by everything else. And these are the meningitis that same time. Acinetobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella, Serratia, Staph aureus, to GBS. This means contamination. This is not maternal derived infection. This is pure contamination in the hospital. So we have a big, big, big um, work in the, the part of infection. Big, big work. Uh, okay, then, then let me tell you about something else. Uh, okay, this is uh, hearing loss. Of course, in kangaroo care, because we follow all the kangaroos care. 15% in the Alta Gracia. This, this hospital receives 60 deliveries every day. And, and they have a, they're starting to work on their kangaroo care. They start to do 15%. That is too much. I work in Jackson Memorial Hospital. We have the sickest of the sickest babies. We do not have all that hearing loss. There's something we're doing bad in the neonatal period that we get all that hearing loss. Um, this is another hospital that receives babies from several places. 16% girls, 16% boys, loss, hearing aid, hearing loss. So then we were, let's go maybe jaundice. Let's go check the jaundice. We bought Cajun uh, transcutaneous. You see these two, yellow, not yellow, but they discover yellow when you see yellow. It's too late. So we went around with this. This baby had a billy of 20. You know, billy of 20 is toxic. This baby's Barahona, the other way, other, con other thing. His billy of these two twins, there's two twins, one is hidden by the man, 19.3, and the other one was 18. They had never done a billy rubin in these babies. Getting a billy rubin is three ml of blood. How can I get three ml of blood? Because I have to do several of those. So impossible. So we say, look at this. You have this machine. You can do it. But it, it, as I tell you, it's not a machine. They have that machine for a long time. It's not the machine. It's the whole education that goes with the machine. And follow up. What are you doing with this? What are you doing? Tell me and explain me what are you doing. So we started another program that is the early identification of jaundice. We got this Billy Ruler. We got this transcutaneous, um, no, this is a billy stick. It's serum with a drop of blood. So we're starting uh, in two hospitals, not only to find it, to show the doctor, to show the doctor. I have to show the doctor and the nurse. Look at this. He's only 24 hours. And look at the, put it in a graph. And you see how high it is. Don't wait until he looks yellow because it's too late, that's why we have, that's part of why they have so many hearing losses. Not only that, but also with the antibiotics they're using. But you know, when you're in a hole, you don't see up. 
That's why for you all is so important what you're doing because you're up here and you can see the things that are down from your perspective. They are down in a hole. They don't see these things. So that's why the, the work that you do is so, so important because you can bring to life and to awareness the problems that they have that they don't, don't know that they have. Uh, so now, the other thing that we found, of course, for our, our kangaroo care babies is retinopathy of prematurity, because of course, we are using a lot of oxygen. Um, so so uh, Dr. Del Moral um, talked to me about, look at this, we can do telemedicine. Telemedicine, yes. There's, there's a way of doing telemedicine. So we spoke to Bascom Palmer uh, because we are not afraid of speaking out and saying the problem we have is this. Never sp we have this problem. It looks ridiculous sometimes, but no, if you don't explain it, nobody's going to tell you, okay, but I have a solution for that. So she presented us to some people of Mexico um, that told us about the lens. This is, it, it is a uh, iPhone. And, and has a lens, and anybody can, that can take, take a picture through an uh, iPhone can take a picture from the retina. They just have to dilate the retina of the baby and send it, like you send any picture, and it goes to a central place, and they screen and say who have to come for, for ROP treatment, laser, Avastin, whatever he needs. Um, and uh, so we already have some. Where the first one is there, the two other ones ha arrived to Miami, are going to go there. So we hope to have telemedicine for the whole country uh, in the most important places. So we don't want to have one baby lost vision because we don't have it. So that is the plan. So education and training. Okay, education and training is the most important thing because we have to educate and train with the equipment and uh, everything else. Uh, so we started neonatal resuscitation training uh, with Dr. Del Moral that she's there, training the trainers, um, uh, creating a network of education. Um, so we're, we, we are starting again because uh, COVID just stopped everything. So we're going to start again uh, with the nurses and with the physicians. And, you know, and educating the nurses is very important um, in the rural clinics because they are first responders. Uh, and there's more nurses. They're 24 hours there, live in the community, no people. The doctor sometimes comes from the capital city, stays two hours and goes back, and is not attached to the problem. You need... You need a follow-up of whatever is going on there. And the nurses are the, the numero uno. Like here in the United States, they are excellent. So um, all this we try to do, the regular prenatal care, the normal delivery, help them identify mothers at risk, and postpartum hemorrhage, that is the numero uno killer of mothers in our country. Uh, so I, one day I went here, uh, and I asked, why is this baby not breastfeeding? Because I saw my grandma feeding with a bottle. No, because mommy's sick. She just, I mean, she just fainted. So she cannot mm, stand up. So she fainted. Why did she faint? So that was one thing I learned, training the nurses. Why did she faint? Oh, I don't know. Let me go examine her. You know, her uterus was up here. So she had atony. And she was bleeding like crazy. But it, you don't see it because she has a pad. That pad was soaked. One thing I learned, soaked pad. Uh, uter, uterus at the level of the navel, uh, atony. So I called immediately, they came. They called, it's called the red code. And everybody came. So, so that is good. You know, so you, you know that people are trainable. They came, the laboratory came, they get the blood everything she needed. So, so we have this wonderful OB uh, in the East that is training our nurses, training how to deliver normal babies, identify when something goes wrong. And um, this is our beautiful, I love uh, uh, community hospitals. They're 
done from many, many years ago. No maintenance. You know, you open the, the maybe there's no water. But the kindness in the personnel is incredible. More so than the big hospitals in the city. And so, and they learn, they, they want to learn. They tell you, doctor, I, I, I want to learn. Tell me what to do. I, I want to put an umbilical co uh, 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 catheter. So I think we have this. Um, so, so how are we working in general? Um, our pillar is kangaroo care because it's working very well because it's already self-sufficient. Already the government took over. So we feel something, oh, the government took over. My No. It should be there. It's when you have a child, you want it to grow and go, you know, to stand on its own. And, and, and that's what happened. Already, kangaroo care stands on its own. Everybody wants a kangaroo care program uh, because they know babies don't die once they get there. So that's our pillar. Uh, and then we're going to care um, after birth to move to intra-hospital kangaroo care as much as possible. But work before the baby uh, gets to kangaroo care uh, with the neonatal resuscitation, with the Pumani and the bubble CPAP, with the caffeine, with the hyperbilirubinemia and infections. We have to sit down and talk about that very seriously. Um, because I think once we do something with infections, our neonatal mortality is going to decrease. Um, and then the follow-up of the kangaroo care must continue because it's, it's tells us what we did in the neonatal area, which is the ROP screen and the developmental screen. And then how we put everything together, uh, these are wonderful people, uh, volunteers, uh, medical students from university, different university. George Suazo is our, I mean, student, medical student, and he's fantastic. He directs everything because I cannot, we cannot go. In the past two years, we cannot go. Everything has maintained because he's there. Uh, Amy, Gabriela, Estefania, Daniel, Lillian, uh, all those medical students uh, take care of different programs. Uh, they learn a lot. And they are happy in their careers. They are very motivated. And now the plans of all of us for this year, and with this I'm finishing, uh, we are incorporating the foundation to the Dominican Republic. Just last week we got that so that we can continue working formally with the government. So we'll continue to work with the local institutions, uh, the Sistema Nacional de Salud. We don't work privately. We don't make a little clinic. We don't construct. We work with the clinics there are, with the doctors there are, with whatever they have. Uh, so it's, um, our, our resources are better used. Um, through those groups, we will continue education and share information and we are creating the trust fund for mothers and children in the Dominican Republic. We are learning from the United States. There are trust funds like, like uh, um, uh, the, uh, all these big companies have trust fund. You, that's how you work. <laughs> in the Dominican Republic, we don't have that. You know, but we have found that in the Dominican Republic, we have a lot of Dominicans in, in the United States, we, in New York. Uh, Chicago, uh, Washington, Miami, Florida, and we're talking to them, tell, telling them, invest in us. But invest in them to Domingo in the, in the part of, of health because it's investing in your country and they're helping us. They are sending their money, but we don't have the fund that we're going to work now with the consulates and uh, everywhere. This is something that we're going to do this year. Uh, so we have a resource that stays there and is always be there for the mothers and the children of the Dominican Republic and of Haiti too. Haiti comes, this is our obligation. Our, um, and we do it with so much love and care. Although many people protest, it is done with love and care. We share whatever we have with the poor Haitian mothers that come to deliver that come very sick. Give me your ideas. I'm full of um, uh, waiting for you to tell me all your ideas and what you think we should do, and I will incorporate everything there. Thank you very much. I'll 
start with a question. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you mentioned needing to do some modifications to Pumani. I think certainly as the, the university that had helped create, uh, create and, and put Pumani out there in the world, um, I would certainly love to hear more about um, what changes you found were necessary to, you know, so that as we sort of take that feedback, I think as, as you know, as, as engineers, as, as a team, to be able to think about, you know, what, if there's, how we implement it in the world. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's one question. And the, and the other two, uh, one of the big um, pushes, you mm -hmm. mentioned NEST, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is, and, and you mentioned mm -hmm. education as a big part of, it's not mm -hmm. just having technology, that's certainly something that we've, mm -hmm. we've seen and believe. And I know that there's a whole suite of resources that have been created in, in the English language. Mm -hmm. And I think where we are working on translation and thinking about making them more accessible. I would love to know from, from your perspective, if you had a chance to, to see those resources and what your, your thoughts as a user, right? your, your user feedback to us as a group of individuals pre preparing those materials, what you would, would, you would request. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, yes. Well, the, for, for the Pumani, the, uh, the first thing we found is the connection with the power. Yeah, it has to be in a special converter. It cannot be any converter. So if we could get Pumani with a, with a power that can be, I don't know what is it, 117? I don't know what it is. I know numbers in my head don't go. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. It is whatever you, uh, we need that we can connect it. The other thing is that we are are trying to, in the resuscitation of the newborns, we are, now it is used to start babies early on since delivery in, in CPAP. And I would love to have a Pumani with wheels. Can, can you do that? <laughs> so that, because Pumani, we have to put it in a table and cannot move it. And, and if we want to give uh, CPAP early in the preemie babies, that we can take it to the delivery room and start the CPAP right there. That is another. That, that's, we're trying to, uh, it needs a, it needs a, con, uh, a concentra not a concentrator, oxygen or oxygen tank. Oxygen tank you can put in several places, it's easier. But you need the... Um, Concentrate, no, air concentrator, air, uh, yeah. yeah, like the Pumani has. Yes, yes that is very good. Uh, and then, uh, and be enough that you can wheel it around, to take it to the delivery room, because delivery rooms are separate from everything and are far away from the ICUs. Uh, and um, the baby is resuscitated and stay there and then somebody picks him up and take him to ICU. So that transition between delivery and take the baby to ICU, they need to start the CPAP early. So that is one thing we, are, we were talking about. If you, I would love to send you the pictures of delivery rooms of, high, of big hospitals. It's horrible. It's horrible. It is. Um, Bed and bed and bed and bed and bed and bed and bed. So we have to change the whole um, concept of delivery. Separate the well babies and have them more like a home delivery with a doula, a mother, uh, whatever. You know, in Africa, I know many women deliver at home. And um, here, no, 99% of all women deliver in a hospital. Uh, and it's not, it's not good. Hospitals are contaminated, are not clean, are not uh, family-oriented, are very cold. Uh, and everything can be good, but everything can be bad. So in the hospitals in the periphery are better because they are um, smaller, not that many. How can you handle 60 deliveries a day? I mean, it's some... Impossible. Those large, large maternities with very few personnel. It's, that's a challenge for us. And I think that has to change. The other question was uh, education, no? Yeah, we, we need a lot of education. We try to write our own manuals. Nobody reads it. That's one thing. We, we, we try to 
we have tried to put it in pictures so that uh, it's easy to read and we, because we do the manuals and nobody reads them. Um, and so that's, uh, that's another challenge. Unless you give them in the class, we are hoping that now that we're starting with the nurses, they will read. Uh, they, they, we, we send them to read and then we question them. Uh, that's another different way we're going to do the education. Um, what do you see as the biggest gaps for educating nurses and biomedical technicians? Uh, biomedical technicians, I don't think they have sought biomedical technicians uh, as, uh, as some part of healthcare. We have, we have like one or two, and we are incorporating them into the, into the Pumani. He, he knows very well how to use the Pumani, how to change it, how to whatever. So we are sending him everywhere there is a Pumani so that he goes and also teaches. So he, he uh, that person, but we, we have it. We are going to create that biomedical technician group because the, the government doesn't have it. And I hope they will take it over. Uh, you know, hospitals educate constantly. Constantly. Every, every day, you have some education from some part. That is not happening there. Uh, so uh, we have to start that and uh, make it acceptable for them. Make it that they can win a prize. They can, uh, if they improve their work, we can give a, name them that nurse of the year, nurse of the month, something like that. We, we should work on that. Uh, we don't have that. Yeah. So Pumani is 220. 220 volt? I think so. I think so. It's 220 volt. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, if there are any questions, thank you. I'll be around. I'll be around. <laughs>